Jesus was made sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. This is the heart of the gospel, the greatest story ever told. The righteousness of God is a powerful and profound thing. It is his divine nature. Through Jesus, we have been made partakers of this divine nature and the spiritual righteousness that resides in Jesus has now been imputed to us. What a dichotomy we are. We have resident within us the DNA of God's divine nature, but our lives only display frustration and defeat. How could this paradox exist? How can we be partakers of the divine nature, but be so ignorant of the things of God? The Apostle Paul understood this paradox. He taught that there is a great difference between the imputed righteousness received at new birth and the revealed righteousness working in us. Hidden within every true Christian is the divine nature of God. I use the word hidden with purpose and direction. Sometimes our base human nature hides and even suppresses the divine righteousness of God. Why would this be? What is the thing in our nature that suppresses God's imputed righteousness? For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Both of these references teach that the carnal mind resists the divine nature of God. Should this be true, then what is the carnal mind? The Greek word used by Paul is sarx, that is, simply translated as flesh, the meat of the animal, void of skin. But the Strong's exhaustive concordance, the Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, and the Vine's expository dictionary of New Testament words all agree that sarx is a metaphor for the human nature with its frailties and passions. William Vine, an English Bible scholar, theologian and writer, famous for his expository dictionary, went in greater detail when he wrote that Sarks represents the weaker element in the human nature and the lower and temporary element in the Christian and in the religious ordinance. From these references and definitions, we see 
that the carnal mind is our basic human nature with all of its self-centered frailties and passions. Why should we be concerned with our frail human nature? Doesn't God's divine nature nullify its existence? This would be a true fact if we were people who had no free will. But God created us to be free to accept or reject His divine influence. Our free will is the issue that causes our human nature to be at war with God. We are not automatons programmed with a predetermined set of instructions. We are free to choose our own way and destiny. This is why Paul wrote that those who are in the flesh cannot please God, because the flesh does not submit to God's divine nature. Therefore, in ignorance or by choice, we allow our carnal nature to hide and suppress God's divine nature within us. It is so important we understand this one point. Christians don't hate the carnal nature in totality. They only hate its selfish cruelty. It's very common for Christians to refine their carnal nature to the point it's acceptable to the local congregation. We teach our carnal nature to not cuss, spit or chew, or run with those who do. We also teach our human nature the correct religious vernacular and doctrine in order to hide our sensuous nature. Remember this one point. The carnal nature, noble, religious, or crude, is hostile to God. But the natural, non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Holy Spirit. For they are folly, meaningless nonsense to him, and he is incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing, understanding, and becoming better acquainted with them because they are spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciated. Paul wrote that the natural, non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome the gifts, teachings, and revelations that come from the Holy Spirit. The non-spiritual man considers all things that come from the Spirit of God as meaningless nonsense, mere foolishness. It's amazing how accurate this one verse describes the secular world. In describing the natural man, Paul used the Greek word pasukikos that has the application of a lower, bestial, soulish nature that is driven with sensuous appetite and passion. Joseph Thayer, a well-known biblical scholar and author of Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, expanded on this definition. He wrote that Pasukikos has the application of that which has breath, having the nature and characteristics of the breath, the principle of animal life, which men have in common with the brutes. It is easy to think that Christians are immune from this indictment, but we are not. It is so easy for Christians to robe their sensuous appetites and passions in religious jargon. 
Paul admonished the Corinthian church that the natural, sensual person is not able to receive the gifts from God because they are discerned in the Spirit. The ability to receive a gift does not change the fact that the gift was given. The sensuous, carnal nature is the root of all spiritual darkness we experience. Our selfish human nature is the hardened shell that must be removed from Christ's imputed righteousness. Simply stated, to the degree we allow the cross of Christ to crucify our human nature is the degree we reveal Christ's hidden righteousness in our lives. We think Satan is our greatest enemy, but he can only have access to our lives through the sensuous carnal nature. The more we allow the cross of Christ to put to death this nature, the less access Satan has in our lives. Once again, our greatest enemy is not Satan, it's self. Let's return again to the first chapters of the Epistle of Romans. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This verse alludes to the fact that the revealed righteousness is a dimensional experience we walk out through faith. However, this verse also implies that faith is a progressive revelation. How can this be? What do you mean by a dimensional experience? In order to answer these questions, we must realize that our walk with Christ is a progressive revelation of His person to us and through us. This principle is confirmed by Paul's declaration that we are to endure a metamorphic process that changes us into the image of Jesus Christ from glory to glory. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It is commonly taught in Christian circles that revelation is new insights we experience in the Bible. True revelation is not our personal insights in the Holy Writ, but it's the experience and the dimension of Christ we abide in. We read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, that the Christ we receive we are to walk in, he is to be our life and purpose. Simply stated, revelation is the depth of personal relationship we have with Jesus. Each time we enter a deeper relationship with Jesus, we enter a new revelation of His person. It's so important we realize that Bible knowledge is not revelation. If knowledge of the scriptures is true revelation, then the Pharisees were right, and in them we have eternal life. This is not the case. Jesus taught that the scriptures were designed to reveal his person. Therefore, we study the Bible in order to experience more of His person. 
each new revelation of Jesus we enter will open several things by removing the cover of our human nature. First and foremost, a deeper degree of the revealed righteousness is open to us. We also experience a renewed faith and glory with a greater degree of grace and peace. The most blessed of all is knowing our Jesus in a more intimate way. So is the progressive revelation of God's divine nature. Have you ever wondered why God imputed to us His divine nature? What is the purpose and goal of our new spiritual life? The answer to these two questions is simple, but difficult to experience. Heaven is not and never has been the goal of our faith. Why would God engraft his divine DNA into the human spirit, if heaven was our only goal. Then what is the goal of Christ's revealed righteousness? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We have often thought the goal of the Christian faith is heaven, but this reference clearly states that our spiritual goal is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. There is only one reason why Christ imputed to us His righteousness, and that is to impress on us His image. This was done in order that Jesus might be the firstborn among many spiritual brethren. The idea that we are to be conformed to the image of Jesus frustrates and confuses people because we have made the image of Christ too abstract and spiritual. The fact that Jesus Christ desires for us to be conformed to His image indicates that it must be an attainable and practical goal. God would never put a goal before His children that is not attainable. Should this be the case, then what is the image of Christ? By myself. I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but Him who sent me. The same verse read from the Amplified Bible. I am able to do nothing from myself, independently of my own accord. But as I am taught by God, and as I get His orders, I decide and am bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. Even as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is right, just and righteous, because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. In this one verse, Jesus identified the image we are to be conformed to, and that image is self-weakness, God-strength. Jesus realized his own personal weakness to do the will of his Father. But he also realized that this weakness is the source of all his spiritual strength. 
Jesus understood that in himself he could do nothing. But God, his Father, was strong through him because he did not pamper or nurse his own self-will. Jesus also understood that his human weakness is an opportunity for God to be strong through him. Jesus did not allow his human nature to be a hard shell that shackled his divine nature. The Apostle Paul also understood this point. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Apostle Paul learned this lesson during a time of trial and physical difficulty. He learned that Christ's strength is matured in him through his own personal weakness. Paul may not have realized the significance of his statement, but the image of Christ was being matured in him while the hard shell of his human nature cracked and fell away. The process Jesus utilizes to reveal his righteousness in us will weaken our own carnal, self-willed nature. The revealed righteousness is the image of Christ having freedom to imprint itself on our whole person. The most important thing we can do as Christians is to allow the revealing process to occur. We also must realize that we have a carnal nature that can hide in our religious attitudes. The cover of this nature must be removed in order for Christ to reveal his righteousness in us. To the degree we allow Christ to awaken within us his righteousness is to the degree we walk in divine revelation of his person. What does the image of Christ look like when being expressed? The best answer to this question can be found in the epistle to the Philippians. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The image of Christ will not seek vain glory, but will serve God by doing His will. Jesus put aside His position and glory as part of the divine Godhead, and became a servant doing the will of his Father. Jesus was obedient to God's redemptive plan, even to the point of death on the cross. The image of Christ will always seek to serve and be obedient to God's revealed will. The mind of Christ is the mind of the cross, 
and the mind of Christ is the heart of a servant. We must understand that the servant attitude is a vital key to the image of Christ and the fruit of righteousness being produced in us. The servant attitude is also the key and path to the successful unwrapping of our carnal nature. The self-centered human nature, the carnal mind. No matter how we whitewash our self-will in religion or rhetoric, it is still resistant to the revealed righteousness of God. What we consider right and holy will often speak volumes about our personal moral compass and our view of the carnal mind. Our moral compass was designed by God to point to the truth found in Him. And with our moral compass, we know what is spiritually right and wrong. But without a true moral compass, people drift in confusion and lack of focus. All morality must be anchored in a belief system. We could anchor our morality in the eternal truth of the Bible and Jesus Christ. Or we could choose to anchor our morality in the philosophers who brought the Nazi and communist genocides. Without a clear moral compass, right and wrong can be purchased by the highest bidder. Even today, suicide bombers use their sacred writings and jihad to justify murdering innocent people with promises of 70 virgins in paradise. Lust and the carnal mind can be deceived by religious manipulation. The Bible is not enough to guide our moral compass. We must also include an intimate relationship with Jesus. Without this relationship, our understanding of the Bible is also subject to religious manipulation. Right and wrong should be determined by God, not human reason, that can be so easily swayed by politics and profit. Stop and consider this one question. Where does the needle of your moral compass 